Hello, 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 hello. Okay, I'm glad you, you guys aren't late this time. I was almost late a moment, but let's start. Okay, so we're going to go through activity 13 that we did, uh, that you had to do the previous time. And then we're going to go through parasitism in more detail, as well as conventionalism and mutualism in a bit more detail than we did the previous times. Let me just share my screen. Okay. There we go. Okay, so this is the activity you had to do um, the last time that we talked, which was not last week, Thursday, but the previous week, Thursday. And it asks us to identify different methods of resource partitioning. Now, there's three basic um, resource partitioning uh, methods. Spatial partitioning, which means that there's space between you that we don't share the same space. Although we're in the same area, we don't share the same space. And you'll see that in the first example, there is morphological differentiation, which means that your body is shaped differently. And because your body is shaped differently, uh, it means that you are going to have a different function. And this, is, this especially uh, happens when we talk about feeding, as we'll see in the second example. And then the last one is temporal partition wing which means that there's a division of time. You might not feed at the same time as the other species, or you might not breed at the same time as the other species, which means that your babies, which are gonna need lots of support, which are gonna need lots of care and attention, they, um, they are, will not be young at the same time and use the same resources as another species. So let's take a look at the three examples that they did give us. Several species of anolis um, lizards live in tropical rainforests. They all eat insects. Some species live in the leaf litter floor, while others live on the shady branches. So that means they feed the same on the same things. But if I am eating from the ground, if I'm living on the ground, I'm going to be eating everything that's falling on the ground or that's on the ground already. Um, but if I'm living in the tree, then I'll be using the things and living of, and eating of the things that's on the tree. So there's space between us, spatial partitioning. And so we are avoiding competition by having space between us. Second one. Two species of seed-eating finches in the Galapagos Islands of the Pacific have different sized beaks. One species eats small seeds and the other species eats large seeds. And this is a typical example of... So, uh, this is, uh, as you know, the Galapagos Islands is one of the examples uh, or that Darwin uh, visited when he theorized his uh, theories on um, evolution. And over here, we can see what they're talking about. The large beak is for large seeds, and the smaller beak is for smaller seeds. So these two live in exactly the same area but they avoid competition by eating different foods and they can eat different foods because the beak shape is different. So there's a morphological difference between them. The last one says to us that two species of frogs live in the same wetland. The tadpoles of one species hatch at the beginning of spring and the tadpoles of the other species hatch at the end of spring. Therefore, there's enough vegetation for both sets of tadpoles to eat. And so this, is, um, this has to do with time. Uh, they breed at different times. So temporary, temporal, this temp that refers to time, that's temporal partitioning. Let's get to today's notes or the first set of today's notes. 
Okay, yes, Tip, would you have a question? Yes, sir. Um, so the morphological differentiation does refers to does refer to um the species feeling feeling like um in differing in different same food but different size or does it refer to the species? Okay, like so kind of if if it's different uh, size of seeds, as we see here, it's not from the same plant, so they're not eating the same food. It's not that there's a smaller seed of the same species of plant and a larger species uh, seed of the same species of plant. It's different plants with different size of seeds. So they're not in competition with one another. We, they feed from the same plant. They feed from different plants because each plant will have a specific type of seed. Now, when we spoke about this last week, you might uh, remember, uh, not last week, the week before, you might remember we also had an example of certain herbivore species like the giraffe, and please don't judge my drawing. And the giraffe will eat from the, the higher branches, and then it's the same species. Uh, but then, then it's not morphological, maybe a little bit morphological, but maybe a bit spatial um, or combination of the two. Well, if I have a younger buck that's over here, it's gonna eat from the lower parts of, of the plant. But normally we need something like a beak size. Beak size is the, um, you, your beak will determine, the beak of a bird will determine what size of, or what type of food it eats. And then that's going to then affect the, uh, what plants it will eat from. And there's two other examples on this picture that we have here. We can see that over here, this slender, more slender pointed beak is actually more suited to eat um, the prickly pear over there, while this thicker, more robust beak will eat uh, different types of, almost looks like that might be an egg, um, or other types of seeds that are even larger than that second one. So is this sound like the same species but different sizes of... Uh... This is not the same species anymore. Um, and when we, when we take a look at the theory of um, if we take a look at Darwin's theories, we will recognize that these used to be the same species. They're all the same genus, you can see. They're all the same genus, but they're already different species. They do not interbreed with one another anymore. And if they do interbreed, most probably their offspring will not be able to produce fertile offspring. So these are not the same species anymore. They are, we're talking about here, yeah, what we're talking about here yeah, is inter-specific, inter, in between, inter-specific comp uh, uh, competition, in between different species, okay. Okay, let's take a look at, um, at parasitism. There's two examples that we're going to take a look at. Velazia and the tapeworm. Oh, sorry, I skipped to the last page. Let me just go up again. That's going to be part of your homework for today. Okay, so when we're talking about symbiosis, let me just remind you that there's different types of symbiosis. We get um, parasitism where the host is negatively affected and the symbiont is um, positively affected. So it's got a positive effect on it. Then we've got um, commensalism, and yeah, there's a positive effect, but it has no effect on the host. And then we get mutualism, where both parties benefit in the relationship. Let's just review some examples of all three of these. This is commensalism. So here's a, a gaudi leaf frog. And um, we will see that it uses these leaves as shelter. So there's no effect on, there's actually no effect on the plant, but it's an advantage to the frog. Then also we get this, uh, there's a, a, we commonly call it an air plant, a bromeliad, and it grows on trees to get more sunlight. This plant that it grows on is not affected, but it's getting an advantage because it's growing on top of it because it gets 
to higher points where it can get more sunlight. Then over here, we've got mutualism. Okay, so with mutualism, uh, we see here that these monkeys swing from tree to tree and get the nectar from flowers. And as they swing from tree to tree, getting the nectar from certain flowers, they actually get pollen onto their hands and so forth. And um, they actually carry that pollen to, to other places, to other trees, and they pollinate the plants. Leaf cutter ants cut chunks of leaves from the trees that they bring back to their home and protect it from other insects. And they eat and plant, uh, so they, they share a home with other insects, but they bring those insects um, some food. Then when we get to parasitism, over here we've got a parasitic, parasitic wasp that injects its egg into the host uh, plant. And when the babies hatch, they eat the plant from the inside and the plant can then eventually die. And this we find with a lot of parasites is that as long as they can breed, they're happy. As long as they produce offspring, the host can die. They don't mind them. Um, and so a lot of times, uh, the negative effect of a lot of these parasites um, only lead to, um, um, as long as the parasite is happy, um, that it can reproduce, it doesn't mind if the host is going to survive or not. Then over here, um, this specific flower we over here, um, it uh, reflects here on our Noldi, it's actually called the stink flower. It, it, it actually has a, a pretty much of a, it's got a, um, it attracts, its pollinator is normally, um, uh, my word, I can't, I can't get the, the word on the tip of my tongue. But it's not uh, something that's looking for something sweet. It normally attracts insects that are looking for something like rotting meat, like flies. And the flies will actually pollinate it. But um, what it actually does is it attaches onto a vine and gets the nutrients from another plant um, from the vine. So it doesn't have its own roots. It gets the, the food from, from vines and then actually it's not beneficial to the vine. So when we talk about parasites, we get two types of parasites. We get ecto and endoparasites. Now ecto, ladies and gentlemen, means outside and endo means inside. Ectoparasites are typically, for example, um, teas and uh, 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 fleas and ticks. And then with the endoparasites, those are your typical worms. Um, it would be a good example of an endoparasite. Okay, so over here it says what I mentioned a few moments ago. It says parasites will not kill their hosts until they have reproduced and their offspring have spread. Parasites may have special adaptations such as special structures to attach to the parasite, to the host, and a well, uh, well developed reproductive organs, which can produce a large number of eggs. And a good example of this is the tapeworm. Each one of these pockets that we see over here, each one of these proglottids, they contain lots and lots of eggs. And then when you've got a tapeworm and you defecate, you've got these little white packets of um, eggs that, that's in your feces. And what will happen is most of the time we find, especially with pigs, the pig tapeworm, tinea uh, solium, we find that, um, that pigs will eat plants that have been growing in this feces and then get the eggs into their bodies where it lives in the muscle of the pig. And so its reproductive stru uh, structures are quite good. Another adaptation that it has over here is it's got hooks as well as the suckers that attach themselves to the inside of your intestinal wall. So they stay there. And so it doesn't come out. So it leaves the, eggs, uh, the egg pockets, the proglottids to come free, but itself will stay inside your body uh, for a very long time if you don't take um, anything to get rid of it. Okay, so that's that's parasites. Um, we're going to go to common symbolism and mutualism in more detail in a moment with some examples. But before we do that, and I'll post this onto Google Classroom,
classroom that you guys need to do. Uh, but just know this, this is for the, the afternoon classes. Okay, so, but I'll post that and this is part of the work. You will also do activity 16. We'll see what the page is now when I go through the next section. Yes, um, I've got two hands raised, um, my usual two. Um, uh, Ruan, you can go first and Steph already asked the question and Chepi, you can take second. I think, thank you, sir. I wanted to ask, well, um, so in one of the textbooks, it says most, most pathogens are parasites. Yes. Does that imply that, why does it imply that not all para, uh, pathogens are parasites? Aren't they all? No, no. If they, uh, because if, um, if you talk about a pathogen, is anything that can make you sick. So some pathogens might be bacteria. Um, okay, and then when we also, when we talk about pathogens, anything that can make you sick doesn't, is not necessarily a, a parasite that's going to make you sick. Uh, we can, for example, um, maybe not the best example, um, but for example, if we take a look at cancer, your own cells um, can be seen as pathogenic, but it's not a parasite. Okay. Yeah. Is it like, a, like for example, a bacteria that that's not so living off of you, but it's giving off a certain chemical that causes disease? That could like cause that. you to make sick. Let's take a look at E. coli, for example. If we take a look at E. coli, um, E. coli is actually beneficial to you most of the time, but in the wrong area, it's not. In the wrong area, it's going to make you sick. Not that it's parasitic but it can make you sick. Um, if it's in your small intestine, it's gonna be fine, but if it's in your stomach, if you ingest it and it's gonna get into your stomach, it's gonna make you sick. So that makes it a pathogen, but it's not a parasite. All right, thank you, sir. Okay, Tepo, your question? So is uh, tapeworm, is a peak source of a tapeworm? Is that a source of a tapeworm? Um, just say again. Okay, uh, picks, where do we get, where, where would you pick up a tapeworm? Is that what you're asking? Yes, I'm saying, um, like, um, can it pick maybe be a source of a tapeworm? Uh, yes. So, um, uh, uh, one, of, one of the main sources of tapeworms, where we get tapeworms into our bodies, secondary host uh, does, is, is normally picks. We can pick it up from other meat, any meat that is not cooked well. Um, so, and especially, and this might sound weird, but um, this is typically a, a white man's disease uh, for the simple reason that um, as Europeans, we tend to eat our meat more raw than we should. So we would, for example, ask our steak to be medium to medium rare, and that means that that parasite will survive in the muscle and we get it into our bodies. Well, if we take a look normally, and it is changing a slight bit, in most other cultures, and I'm not talking about some Eastern cultures like the Chinese, but in most other cultures like African culture, you normally tend to overcook your meat. So it, it's never medium or medium rare, it's rather um, done to well done. And so you never pick up in um, tapeworms very easily. Um, the most common tapeworm is most probably in pigs because pigs just eat about anything you give them. While um, the other tapeworms that we find, uh, like for example in sheep or in uh, other species that we find with sheep or that will in cattle, um, they're not as common because sheep and cattle won't eat certain things that pigs will eat. A pig will just about eat anything. So it picks up tapeworms very easily. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm gonna just stop sharing the screen. Um, I will post this homework for you guys onto the Google Classroom the moment that I finish this lesson. Um, let me just quickly go to the other, there we go. Okay, so this is the second this is our, um, our second section. So we're going through two lessons today. Um, mutualism and commensalism. Okay, so uh, here are some examples and um, I'm gonna discuss some of these in more detail. 
uh, let's just go through two of the, uh, the phrases that we talked about here, but some examples. So mutualism, um, both species will benefit from the relationship. Uh, the most common example we usually use is the sea anemone and the clownfish, um, because most of what you have watched um, Finding Nemo, and you know that example, but here are some other ones as well. Uh, here is an obligate mutualism. Now, obligate mutualism means that it needs to happen. If it's not going to happen, both of those species are going to die. And a common example of this is over here. This is the fig wasp um, sitting on some figs. And if the fig wasp, that's the only thing it eats. And if it doesn't eat that, it will die. And for the figs, the only thing that pollinates the fig is the fig wasp. If it wasn't for the fig wasp, the figs will not be able to, those specific type of figs will not be able to survive. Now, facultative mutualism is, um, it's beneficial, but it's not necessary. It's not obligatory. And a common example of this is um, my ox pickers. And I say, here's an ox picker sitting on a zebra and it's eating some ticks of the zebra. The, the, the zebra is getting rid of its ticks and the ox picker is getting some food, but neither of these two animals depend on one another. If the zebra wasn't there, it can sit on the buffalo, or it can sit on the, um, the, the earland, or it can sit on any other um, of these herbivores, usually. Then, also mutualism can be diffuse or direct. I'm going to discuss that in a moment. And then commutualism is a symbiotic relationship where one species benefits and the other one is not harmed. Here's a cattle egret and a buffalo. And what we find is you'll, you'll always find, you'll find them around these large herbivorous animals because as these animals walk around, they, they disturb some of the insects in the grass and the insects then jump up and that's the opportunity for the cattle egret to eat them. I've actually got some nice pictures that I've taken myself on these cattle egrets and how they feed. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll see where they are and then show it to you in one of the next lessons. Okay, so obligatory. Okay, so this is an obligatory. There's your fig wasp and your fig. And so the, they cannot pollinate, the flowers cannot pollinate without this fig wasp and the fig wasp only eat these types of figs. It's obligatory mutualism. Facultative mutualism, as I said to you, um, if, if it didn't happen, it's not going to, uh, it's going to be okay for both sides of the animal, both animals in the relationship. Diffuse or direct mutualism. Let's talk about this quickly. Okay, so diffuse mutualism is when a species interact with more than one partner, such as a flower having more than one type of pollinator. So this specific butterfly it, it can maybe pollinate this flower, or possibly it can also pollinate uh, another type of flower. So then it's diffuse mutualism. We have direct mutualism, and that's when two organisms, if one goes extinct, the other will probably also disappear. And this is, happens especially with certain types of butterflies and flowers, where their pollinators are very specific. So that says to me that this other plant is not an option to e be eaten by uh, uh, or to take the nectar by this butterfly. And this butterfly only eats from this flower and this flower can only be pollinated by this butterfly. So that's direct mutualism. Okay. Then commentialism, I already discussed the egrets, and that's it. So um, we're going to go through questions now. This is your last task, activity 16, together with the rest on page 250. I'm going um, to take your questions, and then we'll just revise what you need to do for homework. Okay, so I've got two hands up. Um, is it my usual two suspects? Yes, it is. Okay. So Tepu this time first and then Ruan. Yes, Tepu. So the buffalo and the uh, thing, isn't that uh, mutualism? Uh, yeah, mutualism because 
Okay. If you look at the, it, the uh, buffalo the is not. The buffalo is um, that's a cattle egret. It, it it goes around and the insects doesn't bother the buffalo. So the insect is not bothering the buffalo whatsoever. Um, let me just, I'm going to go to that screen. The insect is not bothering the buffalo. And so by, by the egret eating the insects, it's not going to affect the buffalo. So that's why it's mutualism. And not, uh, sorry, that's why it's commensalism and not mutualism. It's an advantage because to I... the egret, but not to the buffalo. But but doesn't the buffalo get uh, the thing removed? Therefore, it, it is essential for no, its, its survival. Not, because the, it, the, those insects are not on the buffalo. Those insects are on the ground. Those insects are in between the grass. It's not like it's not like this one. This is a buffalo weaver, and in this case, the the little insects are sitting on top of the animal, and bird is eating them off, so getting rid of the parasite. But these insects in the grass over here are not on the buffalo. They're in the grass, in between the grass. And they jump up in between the grass and then the bird eats them. So it's not getting rid, the buffalo is not getting rid of a parasite there. The insect was never on the buffalo. And the eagles, then, then they also suck out the buffalo's um, mucus or something like that. Uh, the, just ask that last question again. Because uh, there's a show where I watched the, where the egrets, I think they were sucking out the buffalo's mucus and they were also eating some teak and peas from the buffalo's. Thing. No, that you, you get that not from the egrets. That's normally the weavers, a weaver will do that, but not an egret. An egret, no. normally, uh, sometimes you will find that maybe the egret, uh, and that's quite weird when you do see it because they look out of balance, but they sometimes get a ride on top of the buffalo. But that's about the, the closest that interaction gets. Oh, okay. Okay, Ruan, your question. Uh, so can you explain the, those two types of mutualism and, and understand them clearly? Okay, so we, we get, okay, there's four, four, um, four types of mutualism we discussed. We said, uh, mutualism is either obligative, so obligatory. So if we don't have that obligative, if we don't have either one of these two species, the other one is going to die. Okay. Then um, the, the opposite of this is facultative mutualism. So if these two animals do not interact, if they do, there's no mutualism between them and this oxpecker decides he's rather going to go sit on a buffalo or uh, not ox, uh, yeah, buffalo weaver or um, if he's rather going to sit on another animal instead of the zebra, the zebra is still going to survive. So that's facultative mutualism. Then the other two types of mutualism that we discussed here is diffuse mutualism. The fuse, uh, the, think of the fusion, the fusion is spread. So that means that this little insect can decide, is he gonna eat from this type of flower or is he gonna eat from that type of flower? So that's the fuse mutualism. So uh, you, you, can, you can decide, is he gonna eat from this species or that species, it's not gonna affect him. And then we have direct mutualism. We, if it's a certain type of insect, it's only going to eat from the one flower. It can only eat from one species of flower. And so then we call it direct mutualism. Okay, uh, yes, Tim, again. So all diffuse mutualism are facultative, isn't it? All diffuse mutualisms are? Facu uh, facultative. Uh, facultative, or yes. All the yes. fuse mutualisms, yes, you're making the right assumption there because the diffuse mutualism is most likely going to be a is most likely going to be facultative. It's not necessary. While direct mutualism will normally uh, direct mutualism will always be will always be obligatory. Okay. Okay. Yes, Ruan. So it doesn't, isn't like a diffuse mutualism 
uh, <clears throat> like it, it, it harms the other, um, well, the other receiver, because if you support one, that supports the competition, which is for the other one, right? You're taking, you're taking the dynamics a bit too far for that. Um, uh, it, that, 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 um, yes, there will be competition. And where we find is that with direct mutualism, it usually happens with what we discussed last week, where we have partitioning. Normally, when we have partitioning, we find that we're going to get direct mutualism. But when there's, um, and, and definitely with the fused mutualism, there's uh, a definitely more of an element of competition, but it's usually um, not where, where competition is not affecting the population um, that much. And then we can afford to be diffused. We can, uh, we can afford to choose different types of teams. All right, so, so and also so diffuse uh, mutualism. So Tepo said was um, facultative and then direct was obligate, right? Okay, so direct is always obligatory. The fuse is normally facultative. And what was the other one again, sir? The, the name of the other one? Um, so obligatory, facultative, the fuse, and direct. I tell you what, let it sink in. Let it sink in. And um, go read through the notes. It's lesson 83 and 84. And then yes, uh, go read through it. And then tomorrow, then ask me again. Um, if, and then you'll see, as soon as you went through it a few times, you'll see, okay, this fits in here, this fits in there. That direct is always obligatory. The fuse is usually facultative. But read through it, yes, not directly now, Give it an hour or two and then read through the notes. It's lesson 83 and 84 that we did. Okay. Oh, thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, we've got about five minutes left. Tepu, uh, do you want to ask one more question? Yes. So can you please give an example whereby um, if you use mutualism is not facultative? Okay. So... Uh, let, let me just, I'm going to insert the page here and then we'll talk about that page. Um, okay. So here we have a flower and I don't have a specific example, but I'm going to make up an example now we are, we, it, it's not facultative. Okay. And here's another flower. Okay. Here's an insect, buzz, buzz. And <laughs> insects, so it's got six feet. And so let's say, for example, that um, this insect can go to that one and it can go to this one. It's different species. Okay. And so it's the fuse. Now, in the case of this flower, this flower can be pollinated by another type of. Um, of insect. So it's, it doesn't have a problem. Okay, so it can be pollinated by another type of insect, but this flower can only be pollinated by this insect. And it cannot be pollinated by this one. It cannot be pollinated by that one. And so for this flower over here, for this flower over here, it's obligatory, obligatory, okay? But in, in total, for this insect, it's got a diffused mutualism. You see why I'm saying it's not always facultative because this is facultative. At top here, it's facultative because the insect goes to, twi uh, goes to both flowers. But for this flower over here, it's obligative to be, to be uh, for, um, pollinated by that insect. Okay, so do you see why I'm saying the fuse is not always obligate, uh, is not always facultative, but most of the time yes. it is. Okay. Yes, sir. and so are all um, environmental resistance are they all density dependent factors? Uh, environmental resistance is normally density, yes.
by, um, is, uh, yes, the, um, environmental resistance will be related to density dependent factors. Quite right there. Okay. okay. We've only got about two minutes left, guys. Um, um, I'm going to end off. Um, I'm going to post what you need to do onto the, um, onto the Google Classroom together with, and later when I've edited this video a little bit, I will post this video onto the Google Classroom as well. Thank you very much for joining me.